Um, good afternoon, dear colleagues, dear friends, um, supporters, all the participants of Colloquium Balticum. I have genuine pleasure to welcome everyone to Colloquium Balticum Rigense. And uh, as time shows, it has turned out to be an event of major importance for the classicists of the Baltic Sea region. And an event where the universities of Lund, Marburg, Riga, Tartu, and Vilnius participate. So a network uh, uniting the universities of Sweden, Germany, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. And uh, I think we all know that it was the wonderful initiative of Professor Jerker Blomqvist and Professor Gregor Fogtspira, which started the series of these conferences. And it was in the year 2001 and I had the pleasure of participating already at the first um, uh, Colloquium Balticum event. Uh, it is already the third time Riga is hosting Colloquium Balticum. And uh, in, uh, this year, in 1214, this um, event is of special importance and it carries um, a very special message. This year, Riga is the European capital of culture. So, for uh, this reason, we have chosen for the colloquium this year uh, an over theme uh, which reflects the idea that Riga and Latvia for centuries have been part of the single European intellectual space. And uh, more specifically, it is humanism and humanists in the Baltic Sea region. And the focus of this year's event is on the special role that Riga humanists had in the process of engagement with the ideas of antiquity. I would like to remind everyone uh, that this event wouldn't, uh, would have not taken place. It would not have been possible without the generous financial support of our sponsors. And I would like to name them. University of Latvia, Foundation Riga 2014, Baltic German University Liaison Office, Riga City Council and State Culture Capital Foundation. Uh, we are supported also by the National Library of Latvia. And I would like to cordially thank our supporters. And next, I would like to express my appreciation to my colleagues who have um, in, uh, invested much creativity and much effort in making Colloquium Balticum materialize. And first and foremost, these colleagues are Professor Oyar Slams, please, Professor, let everybody, everybody sees you. Yeah. Uh, 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 the um, event coordinator, Liva Bodniece, where is Liva Bodniece? Uh, their conscientious hard work, perseverance, and organizational skills were fun fundamental for organizing this colloquium. Uh, I would like to thank just as much Assistant Professor of the Department of Classical Philology, Gitta Berzinja. Gitta Berzinja, please let everyone see you. Uh, her meticulous attention to detail and sound reasoning are really impressive. Professor Ilze Rumniece, Ilze Rumniece, please, <laughs> has been most responsive and cooperative 
in big and small colloquium related matters. Actually, we are very lucky and we are very happy to have a classicist for the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, and I think that's how it should be. Uh, and uh, students and postgraduates of the Department of Classical Philology, their help with the practical management matters is also highly appreciated. Let's thank them all. Uh, finally, I would like to express my hope that Colloquium Balticum Regense uh, fulfills your expectations and that we have three intellectually challenging and inspiration-filled days. And now um, um, I would like to give floor to Assistant Professor Gitta Beersinger for reading out the letter we have received from the president um, of the Academy of Sciences. Unfortunately, he cannot be here as he is not in Latvia at the moment, but he has sent us a letter of greeting. Please, Gita. Greetings to 21st century Riga humanists. It is small wonder to anyone that 450 years ago, Burhard Waldis turned from a Franciscan monk and a tankard caster into a playwright and a poet, because he was full of, uh, full of the enthousi enthusiasm inspired by the ripening of new ideas and decision-making. In addition, he had a good basis. Refined thinking developed in Latin scholasticism exercises, philosophical and literary experience, as well as the ability to see the inevitable nature of change, which he could present in an allegorical form by finding parallels between expression of any aspect of human nature or society and the layers of inspiration in the Riga humanist culture. Writings of Catholic reformers, Italian humanists, the works by Martin Luther or Erasmus of Rotterdam that liberated critical and polemical thinking, interpretations of the Bible text or the ancient authors. With regard to the acquisition of these layers, nothing has changed today. Neither the iPad under the pillow, nor life in the Facebook and Twitter webs can help to transplant this knowledge into our brain. Knowledge is not transferable from head to head, either through telepathy or by kissing. All that remains is traditional learning and exchange of thoughts in the form than, that Picodella Mirandola practiced already in the 1490s in Florence with a group of inquisitive young men in the house of the Medici which included, apart from the family members, Leonardo and Michelangelo and Botticelli. Inspired by the ideas found and explored in the ancient texts, they created most outstanding masterpieces of the Renaissance art. Let me quote the hedonic monk Lorenzo Valla, who was schooled enough to be worth listening to and to reflect critically on what he had said. He urged the following. May you derive pleasure at any age and in any way. We, the old men, may sometimes find it more tiring than pleasing, but knowledge is like old wine, which even small persons would inebriate and cheer. My phrased wish derive joy from the meeting in texts and contexts, find satisfaction of what has been read and understood, experience the pleasure of spiritual exchange and inspiring conversations, whose meaning lies in this alone, to strengthen your will, to delve into the spiritual legacy of Riga's humanists, and make it more widely known in the paradigms of the legacy of European humanist culture. 
Ojar Sparītis, President of the Latvian Academy of Sciences. And now, uh, director of the Latvian uh, Baltic German University Liaison Office, Mr. Golombek, has kindly agreed to say some words to the participants of the colloquium. You are welcome. Labaka, Tsinyamas Damas, Ungodati Kungi, Tegere Dam und Herren, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the Colloquium Balticum, the Humanists of Riga and the Cultural Heritage of Antiquity, Text and Context. I am doing that on behalf of the Baltisch Deutsches Hofelkontor, what means Baltic German University Liaison Office. My name is Hans Golombek. I am the acting director of the Hofelkontor. Formerly, I was active in the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst, German Academic Exchange Service in Bonn and responsible for Central Eastern Europe. Our name, Kontor, was, by the way, taken to recall the great times of the powerful alliance of Hanse and the traditional links between important German and Northeastern European trading centers. I am glad to be here in this building, this wonderful building, which also reflects the German tradition and history of Riga. Our office is a joint institution of the University of Latvia the Technical University of Latvia, of Riga, the German Federal State of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, and the German Academic Exchange Service, DAD. Our office has a function to be a kind of German center in the Baltic countries, to be a meeting place for scholars and scientists from the Baltic with academics from Germany and to initiate academic exchange and cooperation between Germany and Baltic universities. Thus, Hofelkonto organizes every year a lot of different educational and scientific events, such as guest lectures of German scholars and scientists in Riga and other Baltic university towns. But first of all, like in our case, promote scientific collaboration between Germany and Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia by supporting joint projects. But the money alone is not able to get a good cooperation going. We need people from universities interested and engaged and willing to organize a joint project with a German corresponding partner. So we have to thank Professor Paperinska and Professor Lams and his colleagues from the Faculty of Humanities of University of Latvia, the project prepared by them and submitted to Hofelkonto was qualified by our selection committee as being one of the most interesting projects we received this year from the humanities. Professor Lam succeeded in cooperating with relevant German institutions and inviting eminent scholars from Marburg University. Unfortunately, Professor Vogt Spira from Philips University who yesterday should have given a lecture organized by Hofu Kontor titled Frederick the Great, King of Prussia and the Antiquity, could not come to Latvia for serious personal reasons. Furthermore, participate 
experts from renowned universities in Sweden, Lithuania, and Estonia. Last but not least, it was, of course, the topic of the project which convinced our experts in the assessment procedure, and they thought it would be highly interesting to look into history and to investigate Riga's role in popularizing the heritage of antiquity in the 16th century. First of all now, when Riga is the cultural capital of Europe and Latvia is preparing to take over the presidency of the Council of the European Union. I am sure you will have exciting and interesting discussions and I wish the conference good results. Thank you. And now I would like to invite the Dean of the Faculty of um, Humanities, Professor Ilze Rumnietze, um, to say some words. Lavakar, darge college, dear colleagues, good evening. I do know that the working languages of our colloquium, Balticum, are English and German. But I hope that you will agree with me that Latin could be our common language, at least uh, on official occasions. So allow me to use Latin. Collegai optimi eruditissimicve studiosi cari e diligentissimi, amici curiositate attracti. Gratulor vobis hodie ad colloquium nostrum Balticum tre decimum rigense advenientibus. Urbs nostra, Universitas Latviensis, et facultas humanarum literarum, cum veneratione et maxime laetando adventum vestrum accipiunt. Hemata et quaestiones in colloquio isto ad disputandum propositae, novitates per multas nobis auditoribus affere promittunt. Non solum humanitatis europeae literarum radice es fructusque, sed etiam diversi aspectus rerum pretiosissimum filologiae classicae tractandi erum. Urps rigae europeum caput cultus humani hoc anno nominat est. Quam obrem nullo modo casu in primis historia literarum, quae basis cultus humani merito dicitur, modis diversis aperienda investiganda aestemandacve sit. Ex opto nobis omnibus congressionum secundam et colloquium ut bonum Felix Faustum fortunatumque sit. After these warm and inspiring words, I think we can start the actual work of our colloquium, the first session. And I, uh, I would like to invite the speakers, uh, Oyar Slams, Christy Wieding, and Arne Jonsson, to come to the front, to the table, and um, give their presentations. Yeah, and I would like to remind the speakers that the allotted length of presentation is 20 minutes. And as we are on um, a very tight schedule, please try no, not to exceed the time limit. Thank you. Oyar Slams is the, uh, the first to start um, the first session. 
Professor of the University of Latvia. Please, Olas. So, good evening, dear colleagues. Um, uh, uh, speaking as the first one, being, being a member of the organizing team might not seem too kind and hospitable. But as we have chosen as the key issues for the colloquium the heritage of humanists of Riga, then it seemed necessary to commence the colloquium with a short introduction about this cultural phenomenon, which incorporates the antiquity almost in its full spectrum. Uh, a look on particular topics related to the humanists of Riga has been offered at other colloquia. But this time is a particularly great chance to take a look on this phenomenon in general, almost from a bird's eye view, getting a closer look on some aspects and taking a wider look on other ones with the intent to mark a general outline of the whole. So, and sir, I need this PowerPoint presentation. So. Mm. Uh, so, once, once more, this picture, which we are chosen for information materials of our colloquium, and it is one of the oldest images of Riga pertaining to the flourishing times of Neo-Latin literature in Livonia. Uh, this image concisely characterizes Riga, and with the help of this, we will try to approach and understand the humanists of Riga. So first of, so first off, we must understand the character and essence of um, Riga. So and on the, this picture is written, Riga per commode ad duna amnem sita emporium celebre et, et Livonia metropolis. And I think we have to answer uh, some questions version in this aspect. For whom and how per commode sit and why emborium uh, celebre? Uh, a convenient location, mm. yes, and this answer is included in the word of Greek origins emborium. Riga is perfectly convenient trading place on the border of different words. That was the fortune of Riga at the times when it was founded in the same time nowadays. The Rigans have long been known for their persistency and the skill to exist no matter, matter what political wind were blowing. The situation of Per Como de Sita had made Riga an object of continuous desire for every power with interests in this region. Riga has always held on to pragmatic and trade-oriented strategies. But on the other hand, the city has always been a meeting point for cultures, nations, and religions. Uh, this multicultural morte has made Riga celebre in many ways. But the efforts to endow the goods with additional value created a tradition of refined craftsmanship, but the sophisticated skills go beyond the borders of utility. Uh, culture as a practical cultiva cultivation of life and culture as a spiritual growth of a human is like swings where the fortune of Riga is swinging. Uh, humanism arrives late in Riga after some swallows in the first half of uh, 16th century at the time of Reformation, main activities happened in the second half and uh, at the end of century when it is already burning out elsewhere in Europe. Though it succeeds to grow vital shoots here. Uh, in the last decades of the 16th century, a small group of intellectuals who may not have been able to radically change the basic values of city create an atmosphere that helps the city 
survive in very hard time. 16th century is marked by very harsh crossroads in the history of Livonia. A significant turning point is Reformation. Riga, among other Livonian cities, becomes a significant stronghold for Protestantism. Luther is a fair supporter of such success in his letters, which have been preserved in the libraries of Riga. The fundaments of Livonian state of order are crushed by Moscovia. Afterwards, Riga is a free city for 20 years, but in 1581, uh, uh, it is subdued by Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, so-called Poli Polish times began in Livonia. Uh, King Stefan Batory, Councillor Jan Zamoyski, and other Commonwealth noblemen left a certain impact on humanistic activities in Riga. But in general, the atmosphere in the land, which has been devastated by war, is not too lively. Ones are mournful about trained impediments, others about the disrupted connections with the Holy Roman Empire, and under these circumstances and conceptions about humanity, which is united in one world, about a world without borders, with these ideas being firmly rooted in the antiquity, are a safe heaven for searching souls. Uh, regarding the universal character of humanism, the Latin language as a tool for communication and thinking, the predilection for antiquity with which, is, with which an in uninterrupted continuity is felt, a question may arise, is there a reason to talk about some particular movement that could be called the humanism of Riga? This notion appears in the re uh, research studies, uh, and it is known and used in Latvian language and also contemporary studies in German, but is not to be found in English. In the, language, in the Latvian language, this notion becomes widely used in the works of the historians in 90, 1920s, uh, after establishing of, Lat of University of Latvia. You can also come across such expressions as the so-called humanists of Riga and humanists of Livonia. It must be noted that only a it must be noted that only a few from the humanists that have been active in Riga have had a long-lasting connection with this city. Because of that, it is not possible to define one specific idea or show a manifesto which could be attributed to the humanists of Riga in general. One could say that the notion humanists of Riga mark only a particular place of activity for several people. However, at the same time, the brightest humanists of Riga, with the help of the characteristic arsenal of expression and imagery of humanists, create a specific narrative about the place and time in which the tension between Reformation and Counter-Reformation is depicted, as well as the multicultural environment representing the complex past and unclear future and the borderline feeling of the inhabitants of Riga that they are living in the utmost outskirts of the civilized world. Uh, the spread of the ideas of huma humanism in a favorable environment is related to three essential events. The establishing um, of a library, the establishing of a printery and the reform of the dome school. Uh, of, of great significance are the uh, Polish noblemen who are interested in the life of Riga and the Rigans involve themselves in the intellectual and the educational activities at the Polish courts. So, uh, Library of Riga uh, started his history on, on March uh, 6th of 1524, when Councilman Paul Drelling hands to the priest of a Latvian parish, Nikolaus Ram, a small book collection from monasteries to serve the public uh, good. The public collection is a possibility to accumulate the works of Western humanists, 
and make them accessible to everyone interested. Uh, the collection grows larger from contribution and these contributions has mostly humanistic character. Uh, in um, 1588, a typographer of Dutch origin, Nicolaus Smolinus, uh, starts his work in Riga. His printery becomes an essential point of the spread of humanist works. So there is an opposition to this intellectual intentions to establish a printery from the practically minded Rigans. The Council of Riga delays as far as possible the opening of the printery and only the opening of a printery in Vilnius and the inflow of Catholic works which endanger the life of Protestantic Riga make the Council change its mind. Latvian historian Janis Strauberg writes, the establishment of the printery would have been delayed even more if the fight against Jesuits would not have forced the Rigans to pay the utmost attention to their own cultural institutions, thus creating a counterforce to Catholic aggression, which was fostered by the earlier founded printery in Vilnius. Uh, the works printed in the printery allow to get acquainted with the events in the third place of significance regarding the humanists of Riga, the Riga Dome School. During the surges of reformation and counter-reformation, the work of the whole was impeded. The city of Riga sought to maintain an education of a high quality at the school so that its graduates could be of used to the city council, diplomatic relations, and private business. During the traveling times of 16th uh, century, there was a repeated proposal to convert the dome school into a, an, an academy. But it was rejected on the basis that the students are too promiscuous and noisy. The five-year school with a hard discipline and completely was completely satisfactory for the needs of Riga. Uh, the language of studies was Latin and the Molinus edition of Oratione Stress is a great example for the humanistic tendencies at that time. Uh, these speeches are given on the occasion of the school reforms and the authors are Nicolas von Ecke, David Kilchen and Johann Rius. But I will stop taking, talking now on subject of Dom School as my colleagues will tell you more about it tomorrow. Some words about personae. The form of gathering and conversation of the humanists of Riga is not possible to restore. At those times there were no fancy restaurants, only wine and beer cellars that perhaps served as a place for informal gatherings. So we can make assumption about autium in Riga from the impressions in the poetry of humanists. Uh, formal gatherings were held at the town, uh, town hall where some of them were councilmen or at the dome school where some of them were teachers. A part of the humanists were immigrants, some, of the other, uh, uh, some on the other hand went abroad and some even never returned. Some of them were natural born Rigans and some found a safe shelter for themselves in Riga in their old age. Uh, as the most influential figures, both for their textual works and their impact on the city life uh, should be mentioned, uh, two generations of these people. Uh, first of them are uh, at, at the beginning of century and they are religious, enthusiastical and cons connected with uh, reformation processes. Uh, second, uh, second generation in late uh, century uh, when some united on, on uh, organized activities would be observed do, uh, to exchange public life in the city. And here we can see some uh, names of these authors. So here, here we can see only uh, 
pictures from these people at this uh, and uh, from one uh, one uh, one man are two pictures at Solomon Francelius who spent in uh, Riga uh, end of his uh, life uh, arriving already as uh, poet laureatus and works. We encounter a lot of occasional poetry among the works of the local humanists. The printed speeches play a significant role in the organization of the city life. There are some philosophical treatises and descriptions of empirical studies presented at times with a symbolic layer. Uh, only a few of the publications are circulating among a wider audiences. From the perspective of Latvian culture history and the reception of antiquity as seen from within the local peculiarities, the most exciting for part of the humanist heritage is uh, poetry. And so, uh, the most uh, attention has attracted Basilius Plinius and uh, uh, in 1927, uh, Latvian historian and philologist Arnold Specke publishes Plinius' poem with a broad commentary in uh, German, but without translation. This is this one. Altriga. Uh, no, unfortunately, I cannot uh, see this. Uh, and read this text. But this is in German without translation, uh, with com uh, just with commentaries. Uh, commentaries. Uh, and then in uh, 1972, uh, in exile, uh, Arnold Specke published a prose uh, translation of this uh, poem. And in 1972, 1997, a facsimile version with translations in Latvian, Russian, German, in English can be, uh, has been published. In this edition, there are a number of historical and philological essays, but it lacks a thorough commentary. Uh, another approach is to be seen in the edition of a Caedius uh, poem, Aulaium Dunaidum. The poem is a monument for the Livonian Riga, Archbishops of Riga being the main subject of the poem. And my colleague, Brigitte Cyril, is the one who prepared this uh, work for publishing with a rich uh, comments and introductory essay and uh, epilogue. And also with a uh, facsimile uh, uh, of uh, this second edition from 18th uh, century. So, coming to the end in my short report, I would like to conclude with uh, uh, thought that the text of humanists can be of interest, interest to the contemporary reader as they evoke the atmosphere of the days long gone but which can at times only be felt in the narrow street, streets of old uh, town. Uh, affection and vitality uh, and empirical experience uh, could affect peoples also nowadays in this um, uh, text. And in some aspects, life uh, hasn't changed at all. And for this, a short quotation from a poem of Plinius Basilius and Comum Rigae. No city in the world has finer beer, beer, nor many thirst be anywhere quenched at the lower price. Tell us you who have wandered the wide world, welcomed as a guest in sundry places, pray tell has a liquid of such sweet savor as Riga mead past your lips to caress your throat. And uh, at the very end, a quotation from already mentioned Arnold Specke. 
the disposition towards humanist values has been a certain refuge for Jean d'Esprit from the surrounding affairs and drums of barbarism, I think, both then and now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I give floor to Christy Weeding from the University of Tartu. As we are a bit, we have um, used somewhat too much time. Probably the questions will have to be postponed to the co uh, coffee break, just to keep within some limits of time. Liebe Kollegen, sehr geehrte Gäste, zuerst möchte ich meine Dankbarkeit ausdrücken, dass die Rieger Kollegen diese Veranstalt die Veranstaltung des Kolloquium Baltikums in diesem Jahr auf sich genommen haben und es mit, äh, in dieser großartigen und äh, wundervollen Weise vorbereitet haben. Und persönlich freue ich mich äh, besonders darüber, dass diesmal zum ersten Mal auch die Studenten der klassischen Philologie aus der Universita äh, Universität Tartu dabei sein können. Äh, mein Thema Latein in Riga in der frühen Neuzeit, Bemerkungen zur Sprachwahl im Briefwechsel des livländischen Humanisten David Hilchen, äh, äh, wächst ähm, aus meiner Beschäftigung mit einem Handschrift während des letzten Jahres aus. Äh, diese Handschrift ist hier in Riga im Lettischen Historischen Archiv, ist bis jetzt nicht publiziert und ich sage auch einleitend, dass äh, ich damit nur ein Jahr, mich nur ein Jahr damit beschäftigt habe und deshalb meine, mein Vortrag hier eher aus den Lesefrüchten und ähm, wirklich ähm, ähm, ersten Interpretationen besteht und dass ich keine ähm, solche grundsätzliche Schlussfolgerungen geben werde. Also Anhand der bisherigen Forschungsliteratur scheint die Sprachwahl und Sprachhaltungen der Rieger Humanisten überhaupt kein Forschungsproblem gewesen zu sein. Öffnen wir die Bibliografie der äh, Rieger Druckerei von Buchholz aus dem Jahre 1890, treffen wir eine hauptsächlich lateinische Titelliste. Werfen wir einen Blick auf die Erstausgaben der Humanisten, humanistischen Werken aus den letzten Jahrzehnten des 16. und ersten Jahrzehnten des 17. Jahrhunderts 
inklusive Vorworte dieser Werke, begegnen wir fast ausnahmslos Latein. Auch die modernen Editionen der humanistischen Werke von Specke und Zirule, die auch schon früher gezeigt wurden, verraten keineswegs, dass die hiesigen Humanisten in einem vielsprachigen Milieu mit den anderen Sprachen konfrontiert gewesen wären oder ihre Meinungen zum sprachlichen Vielfalt geäußert hätten. War der Rieger Humanismus vom sprachlichen Blickpunkt wirklich so radikal lateinisch? Oder handelt es sich hier eher um die begrenzte Ausschöpfung der Quellen? Zu einer Antwort auf diese Frage verwende ich in meinen folgenden Bemerkungen eine bis jetzt unbeachtete Quelle, die von der Gattung her eine Dimension der Vertrauten, äh, des vertrauten Ausdrucks oder wie in der Forschungsliteratur manchmal genannt wird, die Nähesprachlichkeit hat. Es handelt sich um den bis jetzt handschriftlichen Briefwechsel eines Hauptvertreters des Rigar Humanismus, der sogenannten äh, letzten Generation, zweiten Generation, äh, äh, David Hilchen aus dem ersten Jahrzehnt des 17. Jahrhunderts. Es ist eine Briefsammlung von mehr als 700 lateinischen Briefen, die posthum in den äh, 1630er Jahren vom, von einem anderen Rieger Juristen namens Kaspar von Koimann in sechs Büchern systematisiert und äh, zusammengetragen wurden. Die ersten zwei Bücher äh, dieser Sammlung sind sogenannte Epistolae Officiales. Die sind an die hohen polnischen und litauischen, sowohl weltlichen als auch geistlichen Würdeträgern gewidmet, geschickt. Im dritten und vierten Buch sind die Briefe, die Hilchen im Namen von anderen Personen geschrieben hat. Also unter diesen Briefen stand urtümlich nicht David Hilchen, sondern ein anderer Name. Und die Bücher 5 und 6 enthalten Epistolae Familiares, die Briefe an die, äh, äh, an die äh, Personen, also sowohl vom äh, litauisch-polnischen äh, äh, Reich als auch äh, den westeuropäischen Humanisten, darunter auch an einigen sehr bekannten Humanisten wie Justus Lipsius, oder äh, Isaac Casaubonus oder äh, Friedrich Taubmann oder Johannes Caselius. Äh, und äh, in meinem heutigen Vortrag werde ich eben nur diese zwei letzten Bücher behandeln, betrachten ähm, und ich gehe dabei davon aus, dass die Epistolae Familiares viel offener die Sprachhaltungen und äh, der Humanisten reflektieren, als die früheren äh, vier Bücher der Briefe oder dann die publizierten Werke dieser Humanisten. Natürlich müssen diese, diese ersten Folgerungen, die ich hier machen werde, aufgrund der Gesamtsammlung der Briefe überprüft werden. Meine Fragen sind also, wie oft was und in welchem Kontext Hilchen über Latein schreibt. Und zweitens, wie, ist, wie sind diese Äußerungen, seine Aussagen, über die, äh, mit seinen Aussagen über die anderen Sprachen zu, zu vergleichen. Insgesamt bespricht Hilchen in diesen Büchern 5 und 6 seiner Briefe die Sprachen, die, Sprachen, die Probleme über Sprachen in 22 Briefen von 359 Briefen insgesamt. Alle seine Bemerkungen über Sprachen, unabhängig davon, ob und äh, äh, abhängig davon, welche Sprache sie betreffen, sind kurz, von 1 bis 3 Sätze. In keinem Brief bietet er ein kompletten, gründlich ausgearbeitetes Sprachprogramm. 
Deshalb kann das Gesamtbild nur anhand der einzelnen Belegstellen zusammengestellt werden. Unter diesen 22 Belegstellen behandeln sechs Beispiele die klassischen Sprachen. Drei davon nur Latein und drei Latein und Griechisch kombiniert. Vier Beispiele sind über Polnisch, zwei über Hochdeutsch, ein über Türkisch und in neun Fällen hat er mehrere, in der Regel zwei bis drei Sprachen nebeneinander oder im Vergleich behandelt. Wie Sie sehen, Latein alleine ist sehr selten für ihn erwähnenswert. Es gibt drei Beispiele. Wobei das zweite Beispiel eher über das Fehlen des Lateins ist. Alle diese Beispiele sind schon aus dem Jahre 1609, also kurz vor seinem Tod, geschrieben. Ich zitiere nur die Übersetzungen. Zuerst schreibt er äh, an einem livländischen Adligen, Magnus Nolde. Ich äh, bitte erlaube mir, ohne dich zu beleidigen, entsprechend der Gewohnheit, Latein zu schreiben. Die Nummerierung der Briefe stammt von mir. Also äh, im Handschrift sind einige Briefe nicht nummeriert und äh, äh, die Bücher sind natürlich nummeriert. Im zweiten Spiel, äh Beispiel sagt er, ich verzeihe dir, dass du mir nicht auf Latein geschrieben hast. Und das ist dann seinem Sohn geschrieben, dem älteren Sohn. In der Zukunft musst du dieses Problem aber korrigieren. Ich interpretiere diese Tatsache jetzt als väterlich liebevoll. Und das, äh, das dritte Beispiel auch sein, an äh, seinen Sohn David Du hast mich gefragt, etwas Kurzes zum Gratulieren deiner jungen Herren zu schreiben. Das habe ich gemacht. Hier hast du zwei Formen, verwende eine von beiden, wie du willst. Wenn ich etwas, wenn ich etwas zu sagen hätte, würde ich sie auf Latein anreden. So mach auch du. Diese Beispiele zeigen uns zwei Grundsätze in Hilchens Vorstellungen über Latein. Erstens. Über Latein schreiben heißt für ihn nicht, die sprachtheoretischen oder normierenden Fragen, sozusagen Sprachregeln, nicht die Geschichte des Lateins, entweder in diakonischer oder synchronischer Hinsicht äh, zu behandeln, sondern über die gegenwärtige Kommunikationspraxis zu reflektieren. Latein ist für ihn keine tote Sprache sondern untersteht denselben Entwicklungen wie die anderen von ihm beherrschten Sprachen. Zweitens lesen wir aus diesen Stellen, dass der Gebrauch oder im Gegenteil die Vernachlässigung des Lateins ein Mittel für, äh, zur Beleidigung des Einzeladressaten oder einer Gruppe sein kann. Das gilt sowohl auf der familiären als auch auf der äh, öffentlichen Ebene, sowohl in der schriftlichen als auch in der mündlichen Kommunikation. Also ist die Angemessenheit, äh, Angemessenheit, äh, Aptum, Aptitudo, die, äh, gleichzeitig das schwierigste Problem, aber auch die höchste Qualität der Sprachbeherrschung. Und zwar Angemessenheit der Gesprächssituation. Die ungeeignete Wahl der Sprache kann nur ganz jungen Personen erlaubt sein, wie sein Sohn damals war, und muss im Unterricht unbedingt korrigiert werden. Kommen wir jetzt zu den zwölf Briefen, in denen Hilchen Latein im Kontext der anderen Sprachen erwähnt. Und ich bitte jetzt einen Blick auf Handout werfen. Grundsätzlich wichtig ist, dass Hilchen beim Betrachten mehrerer Sprachen nie ohne Latein operiert. Seine Kombinationen sind relativ erwartungsgemäß. 
Als Gelehrte bespricht er in drei Fällen Griechisch und Latein zusammen, als Spross einer deutschen Familie die Beziehungen des Lateinischen und Deutschen in drei Beispielen und als nach Polen Vertriebene die lateinische und polnische Sprache nebeneinander, nebeneinander, nebeneinander. Genauso grundsätzlich ist, dass Latein jedoch keine alles beherrschende Sprache ist, in der Spitze der Hierarchie, sondern sich äh, in der Reihe der übrigen Sprachen einreiht, bald vorangehend, bald nachfolgend. Da hier äh, aus zeitlichen Gründen nicht alle Äußerungen Hilchens über die Sprachgruppen analysiert werden können, präsentieren, präsentiere ich sie in einer Tabelle äh, dem Hauptinhalt nach. Wie im Handout von den Beispielen in der Abteilung 3 und 4 zu sehen ist, ist wieder die kommunikative Seite der Sprache wichtig. Man muss sowohl im schriftlichen als auch mündlichen Verkehr dem Adressaten, den eigenen Sprachkenntnissen sowie dem potenziellen Verbreitung nach die passende Sprache wählen. In der eigenen Kommunikation Hilchens wäre zwar Latein geeigneter, da er dank äh, seiner äh, verfeinerten Sprachgebrauch in dieser Sprache mehr erreichen kann. Jedoch muss jeder bereit sein, die Sprache nach den Wünschen des Adressaten zu wählen, wie er im Punkt 3.1 betont, oder eigene äh, Gedanken sogar in mehreren Sprachen äh, zum Ausdruck zu bringen, Beispiel 3.2. In den ähm, Beispielen unter Punkt 4 behauptet Hilchen, dass auch seine eigene Sprachwahl manchmal ungelungen gewesen ist. Zum Beispiel in seiner Selbstverteidigungsschrift Klippeum Innocentia et Veritatis, die von den Sprachkenntnissen der Riga Ratsherren und Bürgermeistern abhängend statt Latein auf Deutsch gewesen sein müsste. Ein weiterer für Hilchen interessanter Aspekt im linguistischen Zusammenhang ist der Spracherwerb. Dieses Thema bespricht Hilchen am öftersten anhand der klassischen Sprachen, aber auch anhand des Polnischen. Und diese sind Beispiele in der Abteilung 1 und 2. Auch der Spracherwerbprozess muss sowohl der Methodik dem Alter als auch der Schwierigkeit der Sprache nach angemessen sein. So schätzt Hilchen zum Beispiel Griechisch für seinen 14-jährigen Sohn für schwer, sodass er zuerst nur griechische Buchstaben erlernen muss. Für fortgeschrittene Alter ist auch im Griechischen sowohl die mündliche als auch schriftliche Ausdrucksfähigkeit ein empfehlens- und bewundernswertes Ziel. Für zu jungen Schüler ist Griechisch eher eine Zeitverschwendung, stattdessen die lateinische Redekunst geübt werden soll. Beispiel 2.1. Wenn man nach dem erfolgreichen Spracherwerb die Mehrsprachigkeit als Ideal erreicht hat, ist die abwechselnde Verwendung der Sprachen sehr empfehlenswert, wie die Beispiele unter der Abteilung 6 zeigen. Dabei ist wichtig, dass die Mehrsprachigkeit allerdings keine Sprachmischung, kein Eindringen der Elemente aus einer Sprache in die andere betrifft. Es ist also keine Language Shifting. Aber in gewissen Lebensbereichen ist weder Mehrsprachigkeit noch das Übersetzen akzeptabel. Das Beispiel auf dem Handout Abteilung 5 betrifft den eigenen beruflichen Bereich Kilchens, das Recht. Hier muss alles auf Latein erklärt werden, werden, da die Übersetzungen in dieser interpretierenden Art den Grund für falschen, falsche Urteile geben können. Was können wir aus diesen Bemerkungen, Lesefrüchten, über die sprachlichen Positionen des Riga-Humanismus festhalten? Zweifellos betreffen diese Folgerungen vor allem die individuelle Sprachkompetenz und Sprachgewohnheiten eines Einzelhumanisten. Das heißt, Hilchens 
Lateinisch, Griechisch, Polnisch, Deutsche Viersprachigkeit, wobei Latein für ihn selbst bevorzugte Sprache, sowohl für, die, für den mündlichen als auch äh, schriftlichen Bereich äh, war. Ähm, auch die, äh, seine persönliche Vorliebe für, polnische, für, die, für die polnische Sprache ist wohl mit dem persönlichen Schicksal ähm, verbunden und darf nicht auf, die, äh, auf den gesamten äh, Riga-Humanismus äh, verallgemeinert werden. Da Hilchen seine sprachlichen Meinungen aber in einer kommunikativen Gattung im Brief vielen Adressaten mitteilte und dabei überwiegend der jüngeren Generation geschrieben hat, seinen eigenen Söhnen, Söhnen seiner bekannten Adliger, auch den Hofmeistern der jungen Leute, dürfen wir äh, seine Meinungen einigermaßen für die ganze Gemeinde, Rigaer Gemeinde, für repräsentativ halten, für gewissermaßen für zukunftsorientierend halten. So sehen wir zusammenfassend, dass Latein in Riga keine nur schriftliche Hochsprache, sondern ein normaler Kommunikationsmittel auch im mündlichen Bereich war, was für Latein, äh, Gesch äh, Geschichte des Lateins insgesamt wichtig ist. Und ähm, zweitens, dass Latein keine alternativlose Schriftsprache war, da die Volkssprachen Deutsch und Polnisch hier den äh, Verschriftlichungsprozess schon hinter sich hatten. Ähm, ich habe hier äh, auf einen Hinweis auf Kanzleireform äh, geschrieben, äh, was schon Ende des 16. Jahrhunderts äh, von Hilchen initiiert werde, dass in der Riga Stadtkanzlei äh, äh, Sekretäre für, für verschiedene Sprachen äh, 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 tätig waren. Und äh, wenn Sie später noch Zeit haben, habe ich äh, auf dieser Handout äh, einiges unten strichen, äh, einige Ausdrücke, die auf mündliche und äh, äh, schriftliche Kommunikation hinweisen. Und äh, mein erster Aus äh, Eindruck äh, aufgrund dieser Lesefrüchte ist, äh, dass äh, der Rieger Humanismus wenigstens im letzten Jahrzehnt, also äh, ihrer Entwicklung oder dann im ersten Jahrzehnt des 17. Jahrhunderts äh, schon äh, das Ideal der mündlichen und schriftlichen Mehrsprachigkeit äh, ver ver äh, verwirklicht hat. Danke. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to Arne Jonsson from the University of Lund for his paper. There is a handout which has been distributed. Has everyone got it? It's actually compulsory to have the handout, otherwise it will be impossible to understand what I'm talking about. But I think, sorry. Okay then. In the perspective of uh, Riga humanism, the person I will speak about is something of a, sp a visitor to Riga and to the humanistic circle here. He was called to Riga by King Gustavus Adolphus in 1621 to assist the Swedish delegation in the peace negotiations with the representatives of the Polish king. He was not, uh, this was not the first time he visited the Baltic. He had been in Livonia twice before. But that is quite another thing. Uh, I will read a paper about a book. And by now I hope you have the handout. The Variarum Lectionum Libri 6, 
six books of variant readings, was as appears from the title page, page one in the handout, dedicated to Gustavus II Adolphus, King of Sweden from 1611 to 1632. The author of the book was Jan Rutgers, or to use his Latinized name, Janus Rutgersius, a Dutch humanist and diplomat in Swedish service. The title Varia Elektiones is amply justified by the content. Within the covers of the book, you find 636 pages of text critical notes, explanations, and emendations to ancient authors. To give a picture of the wide scope of the book, I can mention that the index of ancient Greek and Latin authors takes up 12 columns. It may come as a surprise to you, it once came as a surprise to me, that someone presents a king, and in particular a king in a very difficult situation with such a present. When Gustavus Adolphus ascended to the throne in 1611 at the age of 17, Sweden was indeed in an extremely difficult position. The realm was threatened from all sides. The chancellor of the realm, Axel Uxenstierna, describes the situation in a letter to the king's mother, Queen Christina, in 1612. Uxenstierna wrote, all our neighbors are our enemies, the Poles, the Russians, and the Danes. There is no place in Sweden, Finland, or Livonia that can be said to be secure against attack. Not only are they all our enemies, the Chancellor continues, they are also more, po more powerful and stronger than we. The political situation was indeed fraught with conflicts. For instance, both the King of Poland and the King of Denmark could, with some justification at least, regard themselves as legitimate King of Sweden. The wars put heavy demands on the resources of the Swedish crown, and so did the peace. The peace with Denmark proved so expensive that Sweden was close to collapse because of the ransom she had to pay. In this situation, the Swedish king and government had to put their trust in the enemies of the enemies, in the Netherlands in particular and in Great Britain, to get military and diplomatic support and above all money in the form of subsidies and loans. One of the means to save Sweden was active diplomacy. One of the well-educated persons the Swedes recruited was the previously mentioned Janus, Jan Rutgers. That was an excellent choice. In his hometown, Dortrecht, he had been taught by the great scholar Gerhard Johan Fossius, well known for generations of pupils for his Elementa Rhetorica. In 1605, at the age of 16, Rutgers was sent to Leiden University where he, taught, where he was taught philology by Josef Ustus Galiger, Daniel Heinzius, and others. A famous former Leiden professor was Justus Lipsius, and I think it is important to call attention to the fact that he had not only made great contributions to philology in the form of important editions of Seneca and Tacitus, but also established philology as a political subject. His treatise on politics, Politicorum Libri VI, had been published in Leiden in 1589. After his Leiden studies and a period in France for continued studies, Rutgers changed his profession and passed a law degree, more to comply with his parents' wish than because he wanted to go in for a legal career, as he writes in his autobiography. He was saved from the bar by the Swedish ambassador in The Hague. Um, the ambassador, Jan van Dijk, had been entrusted with the task of finding staff for the Swedish administration and suggested that Rutgers, Rutgers should follow him to Sweden. Rutgers accepted and went to Stockholm. In Sweden, he made the acquaintance of the Chancellor of the Realm, Axel Luxenstierna. Rutgers' specialization was to be Northern Germany and Holland and in particular, Swedish-Dutch loan affairs. A proper job, job for a humanist. The Swedes were in desperate need for Dutch loans to be able to keep their enemies at a distance. Rutgers' task cannot have been an easy one. The Swedes had difficulties to live up to their obligations, the payment of the installments were delayed, and the copper that the Swedes, that was Sweden's main export product, was not delivered on time. 
the mismanagement made it, of course, difficult for the Swedish envoys to raise the money the Swedish crown needed so badly. When I consider uh, these circumstances, and some others too, uh, you know, Rutgers, the author of the book, lived, lived a life fraught with politics, and the dedicatee of the book, Gustavus Adolphus, was a king who had uh, to fight desperately put, to protect his kingdom and ward off the dangers threatening it. When I considered those circumstances, I could not resist the temptation. Although I have a feeling that it is a temptation, temptation scholars too often succumb to, to try and find out, perhaps, uh, to try and find out if perhaps the Varia Electionis has some sort of political implications, if there were some sort of political message or some other politically relevant hints. After all, when the previously mentioned Heinzius, a few years later, dedicated a book to Axel Uxenstierna, the book was an edition of Aristotle's Politics. So, when you read the title of, the title of my paper, Text Critical Notes as Political Manifesto, uh, please uh, do not take it as a statement of facts, but rather as a thesis I try to argue. I have found three very different types of arguments in favor of my thesis, and I will present them one after the other. Firstly, surprisingly enough, the printer's mark. Secondly, the Augustus Gustavus imagery. Thirdly, the arrangement with the six books. I will explain what I mean in due time. The printer's mark, that's the one you have on page one. On the title page, in addition to the title, the name of the author, and the dedicatee, you find the imprint, Leiden 1618. The name of the printing office, Officina Elseviriana, and an image, an eagle on a cypus holding a sheaf of seven arrows, symbolizing the seven states of the United Provinces. The Northern Netherlands, the Dutch Republic, the States General, whatever you uh, want to call them. The arms was used by the Elsevier's as their printer's mark. You can see a ribbon with a motto which reads Concordia Reis Parvai Crescunt. Small states flourish by Concord. The small states were of course the member states of the Dutch Republic, which was still in conflict with Spain and for whom unity was, all in, was an all important issue. But the motto, was not originally conceived by the Dutch as an admonition to the Dutch to keep peace among themselves. Rather, there is a long prehistory to these words. The phrase, Concordia res parvai crescunt, is a quote from Sallust's monography, Jugurtha. Sallust puts the words in the mouth of the Numidian king, Misipsa, when he is on his deathbed. The saying continues, discordio maximai di labunto. By discord, the greatest states go to ruin. With these words, Misipsa exhorts his three sons, one of them in, is the infamous Jugurtha, to unity. But as our history books teach us, the sons paid no attention to their father, and things did not turn out well, to put it mildly. There was, however, a younger contemporary of Sallust, an eminent statesman who took the words to heart, Marcus Agrippa. Seneca tells us in Adlucilium Epistolae Morales that Agrippa used to say that he was greatly indebted to this sentence. By virtue of it, he had himself become the best of brothers and the best of friends. Thus, it was efficacious words, no doubt a strong medicine. The question we now have to ask is this, could the motto be of any relevance for Swedish readers in 1618? Well, it must have been. The king's brother and cousin, not to mention his mother, the previously mentioned Queen Christina, enjoyed rather independent positions in the realm and could undoubtedly complicate matters if they chose to. We actually know from the sources 
that the Swedish government was obsessed with the question of unity. And it is interesting to note that the king, in a speech in 1617, used almost the same words. Unity is important, he says, in Swedish, of course. Uh, unity is important because unity has often maintained a small state. And by unity, small and disregarded states have been defended against powerful kingdoms. Rutgers indeed, if Rutgers indeed, uh, wanted to sound a note of warning to the members of the royal family, which he was not entitled to do, it was not his business, this would have been uh, unsought, for, uh, unsought for means to do so. On page two, in the handout, you have the dedication to the king. It has the form of an inscription, a type of literary device, very popular in the Renaissance and Baroque periods, and no doubt very appropriate in this case. Rutgers dedicates his book to Gustavus Adolphus and gets a convenient opportunity to provide his master. The king of the Swedes, the Goths and the Vandals, the Grand Duke of Finland, the Duke of Estonia and Karelia, and the Lord of Ingria, with some flattering attributes. Pius, Felix, and Augustus. On page three, you have the dedicatory letter to Augustus. Perhaps you raise your eyebrows. I did when I read it the first time. But you have the, uh, you have the name nicely in the vocative in line two. You, you have the text in the handout, and I will not uh, read it. It means something like this. What we know, Augustus, was a habit for the ancients, namely to hang up their tools or instruments if they gave up their trade and dedicate them to the patron god of the art in question. That I have found that I should do now. He wanted to give up philology because he had become a diplomat in Swedish service. The dedicatee of the letter is to be sure called Augustus, but it is of course not uh, the emperor. The real name of the, dedic of the dedicatee is revealed when you transpose the first two letters, putting them after the T. Augustus becomes Gustavus. It was a game of the time to win new meanings from names or from whole sentences by transforming the letters. In this case, the conceit had been anticipated nicely in the ded dedication by the last three att attributes of the king. It is impossible to know if or to what extent they took anagrams seriously in those days or if it was merely a literary device. However that may be, the, Gustavus August, the Augustus Gustavus anagram proved to be a fruitful conceit. You have a later example on page six. You don't have to look now, you can do it in the peace of your home. It's the medal commemorating the apotheosis of the king. The general idea is of course to bring it home that the king was a great prince and great princes were supposed to be patrons of learning, as Augustus had been. Rutgers mentions in the introduction the benevolence and generosity Augustus showed uh, the writers of his time and mentions explicitly that Vitruvius, the Architectura, was dedicated to Augustus and that Julius Caesar, Augustus himself, and Claudius were writers and philologists. It is interesting to note that among the many authors Rutgers takes great trouble to elucidate, we find also Augustus himself, and that is undoubtedly significant. Rutgers writes that he had planned a complete edition with commentaries of all extant fragments and testimonies of Augustus, whom he calls the greatest prince of all times. But he had not had the time, he says, so the reader will be, have to be content with the present edition. It comprises 45 pages out of the 636 of the Varie Lectiones. To begin with, Rutgers offers a collection of testimonies from Suetonius, Seneca, Pliny the Elder, Appian, and others, and then follows an edition of the fragments of the Res Gestae. You have the first page on page four in the handout. 
The inscription had been discovered in Ankara in 1555 by envoys from the Holy Roman Emperor to the Sultan. Much less could be seen and read in those days, and Rutger's edition is only about five pages long. Some of the achievements mentioned must have been very relevant if you wanted to see Augustus as some sort of proto-Gustavus. Augustus was 19 when he, uh, when he ma mastered an army at his personal decision and expense. Gustavus was 17 when he became king and had to go to war immediately. Both were involved in conflicts with factions, both increased the number of nobles, etc., etc. The volume in its entirety, um, the, six, the six books of the Vari Elecciones, is to be sure dedicated to the Swedish king. But now something very interesting. When we look at the individual books, they are dedicated to various important persons in the Dutch Republic. Each one of them has separate dedications similar to the one to the king, but of course smaller and more modest. Book one is thus dedicated to Hugo Mois van Holly, uh, uh, Rutger's uncle, a prominent politician, well known for his pursuits in peace and war, and a keen supporter of Dutch-Swedish cooperation. Book two is dedicated to another uncle, another politician. Book three to Daniel Heinzius, the great scholar and poet. Book four to Cornelis van der Miele, politician and diplomat, son-in-law of Johan van Oldenbarnefeldt, the leading Dutch um, statesman of that period. All in all, the six books have eight dedicatees all prominent and influential people in the Dutch Republic. The publication of the book meant that a number of Dutch very important persons were brought together within the same cover as the Swedish king. <coughs> uh, Rutgers must have hoped that all concerned should be flattered and benevolent to his cause to promote Swedish interests in the Netherlands. To make a Swedish alliance more attractive, image building was essential. The greatness of the king, or at least the hope of greatness, is conjured up by allusions to the greatness of Augustus. It is my belief that these circumstances should be considered and that they are relevant for our understanding of the background to the Vare Elecciones. Its aim was to honor the king, to be sure but it was also a question of prestige, the prestige of the king in the Dutch Republic. The Dutch were accustomed to great kings, the king of Spain, of France, of Great Britain, not to mention the emperor. In this perspective, who was Gustavus Adolphus? A petty king, perhaps, who needed benefactors and they was constantly in need of loans that they could not afford. No, claims Rutgers, this is a great king. A king to be held in veneration, a prince in accordance with the ancient tradition, a prince who promises to be a worthy heir to, the Augustus, of, to, uh, to Augustus of the Romans. Now a short uh, summary. I think that the idea of using the printer's mark is to bring home the idea that it is important that there is unity in the kingdom of Sweden. And it is a um, discreet way of uh, emphasizing this. Next, the Swedish king is a great thing that is brought home by the Augustus imagery. And thirdly, cooperation between Sweden and the Dutch will be a great thing. This is demonstrated, I think, or hinted at at least, by the division into the six books with the separate dedications. The whole book dedicated to the king, the sixth book, to important persons in the Dutch Republic. And the sum of this is, it is worthwhile to do business with the Swedish king. So, that was the point of it.
you. Uh, thank you very much, all the speakers of the first session. And uh, now it is time for a short break up to 6.30. Downstairs on the first floor, there is coffee waiting for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the speakers and to the audience. <laughs>